Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Welcome to the webinar, Developing a Professional Qualification for Adult Educators. This webinar is sponsored by ASIM Lifelong Learning Research Network 3 and ACE at the University College Cork. My name is Leslie Cordy. I'm from Auburn University, and I'm one of the coordinators for Research Network 3. I'll be your host for this webinar. So first, let me introduce Dr. Seamus Otuma, Chair of the ASIM Lifelong Learning Hub and Director of ACE at the University College Cork to say a few words. Seamus? Thank you very much, uh, Leslie, and thanks to uh, colleagues from RN3. Uh, I think this will be a very interesting uh, seminar, and it's good to see that we're back up and running um, uh, with our webinars, and hopefully this is the first of many more. And as you know, Research Network 3 is um, interested in the professionalization of adult learners, uh, and it's one of seven uh, research networks in the ASM Lifelong Learning Hub. Uh, some of the viewers today may wish to join our uh, research uh, agenda. And Hannes, who is here, is the uh, coordinator of the uh, network. And if you are interested, uh, you can directly contact Hannes and uh, he will take it from there. So uh, that's all I need to say, I think. Um, Leslie, and back to you. Before I introduce our guest speaker, let me just share some thoughts on the format of the webinar that was posted earlier. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted at the ASIM Lifelong Learning website. Uh, Dr. Stephen O'Brien will share about a 30-minute presentation on the professionalization of adult educators. You can post your questions in the Q&A area and we'll try to answer those questions after Dr. Hannes Schroeder's remarks. And then we'll have a QR code at the end of the session that will allow you to receive a certificate of attendance uh, by email. So we're very lucky uh, to have with us uh, today, Dr. Stephen O'Brien. Uh, Steve is a lecturer in the School of Education and Program Director of the Postgraduate Diploma in Further Adult and Community Education at the University College Cork in Ireland. He is a graduate of Cork, London, and Bristol universities and has published widely on various topics, <clears throat> excuse me, including adult education, educational inclusion, curriculum, critical pedagogy, and learning theory. His most recent book entitled Inside Education, Exploring the Art of Good Learning was nominated for a prestigious Grammeyer Book Award here in the US. He works with PhD students and his current research interests include adult educator narratives, making cases for critical ethnography and sharing education with the wider public. Thank you, Steve, for uh, being with us and we're excited to hear from you on your presentation on professionalization. And, and thank you for that lovely introduction, Leslie, and um, hello to everybody from wherever you are. Um, and, and I hope that you're all well. Um, thank you to Leslie for hosting the event, to Hannes for being respondent, to Seamus, uh, Chair of the Lifelong Learning Hub, uh, for his invitation, and to Naya and Fuang for all the hard work behind the scenes. And I hope that we have a, an enjoyable conversation together. So today um, I'm going to be looking at um, talking about a new program that we've developed in UCC uh, between two departments, um, the School of Education and the Centre for Adult Continuing Education. And um, so today I'll be looking firstly at a very brief history of further education and training in Ireland. And secondly, I'll be looking at the genesis and ambition of our new program. And I'll be focusing on five key framing principles in particular. And finally, hopefully this will stimulate good discussion around key lessons on how to prepare for the next generation of professional adult educators. So to understand the history of further education and training in Ireland, um, we, we, we kind of utilize this concept developed by Professor Dennis O'Sullivan called policy paradigms. And this particular concept um, highlights the fact that history and indeed educational policy located therein is never neutral. Um, which behoves us really to regularly interrogate and critique it. So in other words, we have to look beyond history as a set of linear chronological events 
and start to interrogate what it really means in our field of discipline. So Dennis O'Sullivan talks about policy paradigms um, that embody linguistic features. There's the particular languages used at particular times of our history. Um, it also embodies the epistemic, um, meaning certain knowledge forms are privileged over others. There's normative qualities to educational policy, meaning that we're asked to do things uh, we should or ought to perform in particular ways. There's membership qualities, there's procedural qualities and so on. So in other words, Policy paradigms highlight the fact that uh, along history, we are defining particular problems attaching to adult education. We're considering what is worthy as data. We're recognizing who is legitimate as a participant and with what status and so on. Um, for adult educators then, we need to find our place within history and find out where we sit with all the policy developments that have happened over the years. But this is not an easy task because uh, with policy over the years comes the idea of the circulation of truths and untruths. And um, as adult educators, really, we need to start keeping in mind that we are located, we are positioned, if you like, somewhere along the line. Um, and just to give you an example of that, the very first paradigm that we can look at is the colonial period. And Ireland, as people will know, was colonized for some 700 years. And the very outset of the national school system, which began in 1831, actually preceded the British system. Before then, Catholic youth were educated via clandestine, what we called hedge schools. These were secret schools, um, paid largely by communities, showing a high appetite for education, particularly uh, in the ways in which it retains and promotes cultural and national identity. Here is a picture of an old hedge school with an old master teaching. In, in silence and, and, and in secrecy. And um, what it really shows is the Irish national school system, which began um, by the British in 1870, really was about control of its nearest neighbor um, and the idea of promoting Protestantism in the English language and English culture. So the new national system emphasized the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, but it also incorporated manual instruction, such as needlework, woodwork, agriculture, that often responded to local training needs. Indeed, the Intermediate Education Act of 1878 introduced the idea of payment by results. So schools were paid by their results. This idea of early performativity is really a sort of a colonial construct that happened in our history. And the post-primary sector was originally class-based, catering mainly for the landowning Protestant population. In 1893, a Technical Education Association of Ireland was set up, and this emphasized science to industry instruction. And the Agricultural and Technical Instruction Act led to the establishment of technical instruction throughout the country, emphasizing woodwork, metalwork and technical schools and so on. At this time as well, local training was funded by local rates and local communities, which is a feature to this present day of how vocational education is centred in Ireland. It is actually regionally centred and regionally governed. So this was our earliest epoch, if you like, one of four. The second epoch O'Sullivan calls the theocratic policy paradigm. And this was by 1922 with the formation of the free state government in Ireland, vocational technical education was about to change. Um, Gerard Looney notes how this fledgling government had to focus on the economic needs of a country that was impoverished. So responsibility for further education and training moved from the Department of Agriculture to the Department of Education during this period. There was a commission report in 27, um, and it separated technical education into three distinct categories. One was continuation education, and this is for 14 to six year olds not attending secondary schooling or post-primary. Secondly, there was technical education to describe employment related work. And thirdly, there was higher technical education, which described the training of technical managers for mechanical and electrical work, and which could be used to train teachers as well. Interestingly, in our area, training teachers was first discussed in this late 20s period. In the era of church control, that's what O'Sullivan called theocratic policy paradigm, characterized the aim of education as a settled matter on the principles of Christian view of human nature and destiny. 
Something interesting happened in 1930, however, the Vocational Act happened and it proclaimed the state's, not the church's responsibility for vocational education, which was designed to directly respond to trade and industry needs in Ireland. At the same time, however, church control was still evident. It had prohibited vocational uh, educational committees from delivering general education to avoid competition with its own post-primary schools. And so what happened was the vocational schools were often seen as second class, literally, to the existing secondary school system. Um, Glanton notes, quoting Duncan, that the snobbish element in the Republic, mainly among the ranks of shopkeepers, tended to look down on vocational schools as only suitable for the poor and the working classes. In 1950s, Ireland was fairly impoverished um, and so widespread change in the vocational system was not possible until the next period, Epoch 3. This O'Sullivan regards as the human capital policy paradigm. Um, something happened in 1958, a, a very famous civil servant by the name of T.K. Whitaker um, published a, an article called Economic Development, which led to the first program for economic expansion. And this signaled the move from a protectionist economy to a very open economy. In 1960, Ireland sought entry to the European Economic Community. In 1961, it participated in an OECD conference in Washington. And in 1965, the famous Investment in Education report was published. Now, this represented the paradigmatic shift away from personal moral development from the previous epoch towards a predominant concern for the economy and human capital values. The unambiguous route to tackle this advantage and enhance equal opportunity was set forth. Investing in human capital, getting a job, was seen as an investment in oneself and one's national economy. Perhaps the most radical reform during this time was 1967 when the then Minister for Education, Donna O'Malley, who is pictured here, introduced free post-primary education. And this had a huge social progressive development in our country. Um, the number of 15-year-olds in full-time education increased from 50% in the early 60s to 70% by the 70s, 85% by the late 70s, and 97% to almost near completion rate presently. Many other notable things happened during this period. The Higher Education Authority was set up. The National Educational um, Adult Learner Organization was set up called AENTIS, that was 1969. Regional technical colleges were set up to provide vocational education in between post-primary and third level, and indeed at third level. And there was a great sort of development uh, through the European Social Fund in establishing pre-employment courses, vocational courses, national adult literacy, and so on. In 1992, the Colleton Report, an industrialist, Jim Colleton, published its own findings that Irish industry needed to be more competitive, reduce its costs, and respond much more to industry. And this was hugely influential. So while it's clear that during this third epoch there were many socially progressive advances in adult education, at the same time, it is defined by the ascendancy of the education economy relation and human capital investment. The fourth and what we identify as the continuing uh, epoch uh, was known as the neoliberal policy paradigm. In 1997, the OEC published uh, an international adult literacy survey that highlighted that one in four of Irish adults scored at lowest level uh, in literacy. A further 32% sample scored at level two, a level considered to be inadequate to fully participate in daily life. At this time, lots and lots of legislation was incurred. You had the 1998 Education Act, 1999 Qualifications Act, 2000 Welfare Act, Teaching Council Act, uh, which established the Teaching Council as the professional accreditation body in our country for all teachers. And they are the body that this programme that we're introducing answer to or um, are applying towards uh, professional accreditation. Um, and the white paper at this stage 
um, indicated um, that there was some interesting and competing interests between the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment and Education. And this remains a struggle to this day, providing a skilled workforce and at the same time um, catering for community education, community education facilitators to, uh, uh, in, 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 in a kind of a, a contested terrain. And the EU also became very influential. The Lisbon strategy in 2000 uh, planned to make Europe the most competitive and dynamic knowledge-based economy in the world. Um, and, and so we were now, if you like, responsible to supranational bodies in policy levels. The Celtic Tiger years, the great promotion of the economy happened 1995 to 2007, and the fallout of that happened with stringent rationalization impacting on adult education to this day. Overall, uh, at this point, you can see that through the SOLAS strategy and the SOLAS are the organization in Ireland responsible for training, the Training Authority of Ireland, um, there has been a massive um, a impact on professionalization going forward and the effects and affects of neoliberal accountability demands have caused some tension and a lot of requirement on the part of adult educators to respond to. Um, many people, for example, point to the real tension between how things are made accountable, how success looks, how many adult educators completed the course, for example, may not tell the story of how adult educators and their learners have experienced that course, how many are in employment doesn't tell the full story, etc. And so the first framing principle for our new programme is that it is so important for adult educators to look back at history in order to look forward in what it is they do with their adult learners. And there are key lessons from Irish history. The first is that there has always been a status divide between liberal and vocational forms of education in Ireland. And this widening of the, of the dichotomy between liberal and vocational education is clear to see throughout history. And so we must reflect carefully on that. The second is that adult education and further education providers cannot solely cater for the already educated. Beyond simply progressing learners further advancement or upskilling, FET needs to inclusively cater for others, and it does. This caring, inclusive and success for all tradition needs to be given higher symbolic status. A more in-depth critique of the education economy relation is needed. The education economy relation has been built into the work of FET throughout Irish history. Um, and we must ask ourselves whether or not we need to, as adult educators and providers, redefine outside of marketized logic what choice and performativity and success and data, et cetera, look like. So one of the key framing principles for us in our new program was the need to look foundationally at our history. Where are we now in order to know where are we going forward? So. The background and context in the new postgraduate study then is, 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 of course, the idea that history is never written and we are in the now. And um, one of the major legislative changes that have happened in the last epoch has been the requirement for teachers in the FET sector to have a specific FET qualification. And that's happened from April the 1st in 2013. This programme that we're talking about right now in University College Cork is currently under professional accreditation with the Teaching Council, the body that oversees professional qualifications in this country. The primary outcome of our new program is the award of a teacher education qualification. And that's for graduates who can apply for teaching jobs in the post leaving cert, that's the post baccalaureate sector, further education sectors, training centers, youth reach centers, adult education programs and community education programs. The diversity is astounding. The program that we're hoping to offer serves both practicing teachers, those who uh, are in the system, teaching in the system, but I've yet got the qualification, as well as those who wish to elect to enter the sector as new teachers in the FET sector. The lifelong learning rate in Ireland is lower compared to the EU average, and new targets have been set. In Ireland, we have a really interesting case of the highest number of our young people, that's the 25 to 34 year olds, having a third level qualification. That's 58% of our young youth have a third level qualification in Ireland compared to an EU average of just 
At the same time, apprenticeships uh, lag well behind our own national targets and Europe, and that is being addressed currently. We're seeking to have at least 10,000 apprentices um, trained uh, every year um, from next year onwards. Ireland's population has risen. We looked at the colonial period. We're over 5 million for the first time since 1851. Um, and our own city is actually going by 50 to 60%, which is an incredible rate. Um, new policy directions are very, very hopeful. There's the latest program for government. There's the establishment of a new minister for further and higher education. There's um, the training authorities, new five-year roadmap for the FET sector, plans to overall overhaul the access to the higher education system that will include further education and apprenticeship choices and not just higher education ones and so on. And in Cork, which is a UNESCO learning city, we have learning regional action plans, we have strategic plans at local level to increase the diverse range of adult learners right across the board. And this is extremely hopeful and timely for our new programme. And so our programme is also making history because it is uh, aligning with the help of Seamus O'Tuma and the heads of school in education. Uh, we have for the first time an alliance between two departments in the university. One and on the left you see is the School of Education, um, close to 120 years of teacher education experience, mostly at early years in primary and post-primary level and never before at adult, adult education level. Um, and then we have ACE, uh, over 75 years now of serving adult education to Cork, Munster and, and beyond, uh, with a very strong equality, diversity, inclusion focus, with over some 3,000 adult learners. And of course, it currently hosts the ASIM Education and Research Hub for Lifelong Learning, uh, which you will be well aware of. So this is a unique opportunity for two wonderful schools to come together with their great traditions and bring together a programme. And this program is known as PD FACE, Postgraduate Diploma and Further Adult and Community Education. And here are ten, nine program learning outcomes, PLOs, that will tell you a little bit about the kinds of graduates, the kinds of adult educators we hope to nurture. Sorry about the wordiness of this slide now, but I just I thought I'd give you sort of the broad range of knowledge, skills, attitudes, values, actions that we hope to nurture amongst our adult educator population. You'll see the first two here, particularly noted on history, the importance of history, which we have looked at, um, to evaluate the historical, philosophical, social and educational context within which FET takes place nationally and internationally, and to look at contemporary features of teaching and learning uh, with a view to responding positively to new policy and practice directions. There are many others, and I'm will um, highlight at the end to you, the web page will give you further detail on, on, on those kind of knowledge skills uh, that we hope to nurture. Just to give you a flavor of the program, we're designing it around um, existing teachers in FET's working lives and their busy family lives. So it's a weekend and blended feature to this. So it's completed over two years part-time, which is three semesters, which will be 16 months semester time really. Um, there's a practical teaching element with over 100 hours of teaching involved, um, hopefully in two contrasting uh, settings, such as, let's say, the traditional vocational and an adult community education setting to allow for uh, diverse experiences and diverse languages and ideas to be shared. Um, there's a foundation studies element to our course, which will engage the foundations of psychology, philosophy, sociology, history and policy. Um, and there's a professional studies element, usually on Saturday mornings, which will be there to prepare and develop student teachers' knowledge, skills, attitudes and understandings in teaching and learning methodologies, inclusive learning study and implementation of their teaching in authentic settings. And then the teaching placement part is there, which I can talk to um, a little bit here, and maybe some questions might be around this. It involves observation, supervision, um, two visits each year, um, year one and year two, four visits entirely, and at least 100 hours of teaching on recognized courses at what we call the qualifications levels one to seven. Um, and that's the sort of overall program content and structure that we have on offer. Obviously, it's broken down to individual modules, and I can speak to that if so needed.
So I hope I'm doing okay on time. I think I am. And I want to talk a little bit about the, um, the framing principle too, which is for us, it's important to practice what we preach. You'll see some images here um, that you have um, in relation to different learning environments. You, on the right-hand side, you have community education setting. In the middle, you might have an apprenticeship workshop you're based on, and again, a workshop on the left-hand side. You may be dealing with horticulture, outdoor education. We're very conscious that the learning environment, the classroom, the place of learning looks very different in FET, and sometimes it's outdoor, sometimes it's very active, sometimes it's very dialogical, uh, and we need to model engage new learning environments and prepare future adult educators for their settings. And one of the things is for people to share their own worlds. And we don't know in advance who the learners are just yet. And so we may end up with many, and we are likely to end up with many diverse learning environments, including the online classroom, where that space is now very much part of our program. And every four weeks on Saturday, we will walk adult educators through how to design distance learning curricula and how to assess online. And we will include the online classroom as very much part of our pedagogical environment. So the, the play on words, the jeu de mots here, practice what we preach. The emphasis here, 25 credits out of 60 is on teaching placement. And it's really about bringing that teaching placement to the fore when we are speaking to um, and working with our adult educators by weekend. Um, we have met, set up a new partnership with a horticultural practice program in University College Cork and we will bring um, the adult educators outdoors as well and it's appreciating that there is no model classroom to engage with that we all have to share in each other's learning environments and then through those conversations and through the modeling uh, indeed teachers will model their own practice and show um, what we call micro teaching sessions show videos of their own practices in their own settings in the curriculum on Saturdays so that people will get to see and appreciate the diverse context, the diverse learners, the diverse teaching and learning strategies at play in situ. Um, and that's making it meaningful for the adult educators, we hope. The third framing principle behind our program is really to be faithful to andragogy. And, th and that really means going back to first principles on what andragogy means. It looks at the theorists, um, uh, the German philosopher Karl Gruss, for example, or, or Malcolm Knowles, um, Edward Lindemann, the meaning of adult education way back in the 20s. And of course, we are up to date with our evidence-based studies as well, um, constantly focusing on adult education um, being about real life situations, being about flexible learning environments and better structured and personalized curricula, emphasizing the role of experience and self-direction and relevance and so on. And we can only get that by going back to andragogical principles. So some of the key principles that inform our program that give it its philosophical framing uh, is really the notion of self-directed learning, which we know is about actively engaging learners, setting their own learning goals, uh, selecting their own resources and evaluating their progress, providing guidance and support, of course, because self-directed learning doesn't mean leaving them off on their own. As we know, it's about scaffolding, but allowing for significant learner voice and learner autonomy in that work. Uh, another key concept is funds of knowledge. This is sort of a Velez Imbanez Greenberg's work and Lewis C. Mall from the University of Arizona, um, where we recognize that adults already have life experiences and that these are valuable resources for learning um, and they can be used to enrich the educational process. This is where they share their experience and facilitate discussions. They talk about their prior experiences and so on. So funds of knowledge is to say that the curriculum doesn't start uh, in abstract. It is where the learners are at. And that's the third um, key concept here. Um, this is where I suppose educators are considering the diverse backgrounds and objectives of adult learners and are flexible in adapting their own instructional strategies to meet these needs. We plan, for example, in induction period to really um, have a profile of all the adult educators that we are going to serve, um, their different sectors, their own backgrounds. And of course, the first part of our course is really about them sharing all that together so that we have an idea of who we are um, and who we are about to learn as we go along together. Okay, 
And then the problem posing learning, of course, this comes from very the Freirean concept of problem posing is really presenting our student teachers with real world problems and encouraging them to apply their knowledge and skills. Um, it's about nurturing their motivation, their interests, and being conscious of their well-being and the fact that they may not be um, so well um, comfortable with university settings, for example, or having prior educational experiences that were less than positive. It's about developing Carl Dweck's notion of growth mindset. And while psychology will deal with a lot of these issues, uh, just to say that this really has to permeate throughout the program. Um, the final sort of uh, one that we identify as important to andragogy is the notion of formative assessment, where not everything is assessed and not everything is assessed through the traditional means, um, such as essay writing uh, and so on. So we have an awful lot of very different forms of assessment um, online um, through discussion boards and fora, um, but also through debates. Um, and through performance assessment and one's own teaching, for example, and the idea that when we do assess uh, someone's teaching that the visits are formative first and foremost and that people learn from their experiences when reported and when given a report in each visit before summative assessment can happen. So formative assessment is really about not um, giving too much um, away to traditional forms of assessment. And in fact, we've shared assessment so that it is 20, 20, 20, 20 credits each semester to making up the full 60 credits. So there's no overload as well throughout the course. That's, that's something we thought of. The fourth framing principle is the idea that adult educators are connected to the world. Who they are is really important. This graphic here is from Mary Piper's uh, wonderful poem, I Am From, which is uh, her writing to change the world text in 2006. And in this, it, it really highlights the fact that we're really working with adult educators working on themselves uh, in relationship with others and indeed in relationship to the planet as well. And so where as far as possible, what we would like to foster is uh, an, a, a real closeness to social action projects out there. In fact, one of our modules is called Adult Education for Social Change. The person delivering that module is um, the Lifelong Learning Festival coordinator uh, for Cork, uh, Mr. Dennis Barrett. And he deals with real projects, real action in the community, working closely with non-governmental organizations, local and global, and showing really all the adult educators the kinds of work that's happening out there that make a difference. It also, of course, makes reference to the Sustainable Development Goals, whether it be about sustainable trade, environmental protection, conflict and stability, gender equality, human rights, uh, volunteering in action and so on. And it identifies the fact that really, you know, the work that we're doing is impacting citizenry and adult educators have that great potential to make a positive impact locally and globally. In fact, we, we will use the phrase global identity to show that local and, uh, and global are to be fused together. And we, we draw on the work of Vanessa Andriotti and others to show that global citizenship education is going to be something that permeates our program um, and very much so and that adult education is a particular transformative quality that we hope to nurture. Uh, the final frame, um, framing principle really is uh, to, to note that when we're working with adult educators we are saying that teacher education is a journey, it's a learning journey. First of all, it's an epistemic journey. We know more, we have more skills as a result of journeying. Um, so it's about knowledge and skills. Sure, epistemic journey is really important. It's really important as well because each adult educator will be working in their own sectors. So whether it's uh, beauticians or construction apprentices or whether it's community educators, they all have their own standards which they need to uh, achieve through knowledge and skills. That's an epistemic journey. The second journey as a learner is that it's an ontological journey. That's a fancy academic term for really, it's about how do we become who we are? So it's not just about knowing more stuff and being able to do more stuff. It's also about knowing about oneself and one other, on, on one's others in the class. And it's about values as well. Um, and so we hope really to try to generate discussion and maybe we can begin now by generating discussion on what kinds of knowledge, what kinds of skills, what kinds of values and actions would we wish to nurture amongst the adult educator community? And we 
we, of course, as adult educators ourselves are learners. And just to say that we don't have everything in situ. This is a program that has been conceptualized and has done an awful lot of research has gone into it conceptually, but also empirically what's working elsewhere. And um, but we don't know how well it works till we're up and running and we're only starting in September. And we look forward to hearing your views on this. And we really appreciate your experience and this research network's particular focus uh, on that question of how to prepare the next generation of professional adult educators. And I thank you for your time and invite your questions. Uh, uh, and thank you once more to everybody. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. O'Brien. Um, that was a wonderful presentation, very robust overview of the history of adult education the philosophies and theories and your wonderful program that will start in September on further education. <clears throat> I will remind you that you can post your questions in the Q&A and or you can raise your hand. Um, I've also posted the website for the program in the um, in the chat area. And now I'd like to welcome um, Dr. Hannes Schroeder. Uh, to briefly share his thoughts on the presentation and anything else he would like to provide. Dr. Hannes is the lead coordinator for ASIM Lifelong Learning Research Network 3. He's also a full professor and the lead um, head, re head of research in the German Institute for Adult Education. Dr. Schroeder? Thanks, uh, Leslie. Uh, and uh, first, Stephen, uh, thank you very much uh, for your nice presentation and the very interesting insights into, uh, I think, um, the carefully thought out and also demanding future PD phase program at UCC. And uh, what I really like in the program is especially um, the last framing principle, um, adult educators uh, as learners. So uh, lifelong learning, uh, at least during uh, um, the working uh, life uh, for adult educators. And um, I really like that the program addresses um, all the different components of professional competencies. So uh, professional knowledge, uh, professional vision, uh, professional action, as well as uh, professional attitudes and beliefs. And um, that there seems to be a clear focus on uh, professional acting. And uh, we all know, not only in the uh, sector of uh, adult education, but also in the school sector, that there is something like a practice gap. Uh, so when the educators and teachers uh, face um, the learners in the real uh, classroom or course settings, um, that uh, many of them really um, face a lot of problems uh, to turn all their knowledge uh, into uh, sensible um, actions and uh, to support um, their learners. Um, and so um, I would like to ask you whether you could tell us a little bit more on how the students will be supported uh, both in preparation for and uh, during uh, teaching placement. Uh, so did you think about, say, professional learning groups or body teams um, using authentic video cases, um, stuff like that? Um, so uh, it would be nice uh, if you uh, shared your ideas with us. Yeah, and thank you, Hannes, for your nice comments and uh, for that excellent question. I have to say the teaching placement element um, is so diverse for the different members of what will be the class group um, that the first and foremost, it's about sharing about their context, um, who their learners are, where their learners are at, um, their own background and biography. So working on their selves is really important. So we have an electronic portfolio that's kept throughout the year for teaching placement, a place where um, the teacher educator is going to be reflecting continuously um, on such matters. We have formal criteria that match, if you like, the visit reports that will happen um, and the formative assessment piece that will be given after each visit so that um, student teachers become aware of what they're doing well, first and foremost, 
what areas they may need to develop and how it is they're going to go there in terms of formative assessment. So that electronic portfolio is the kind of the touchstone, the piece that we constantly keep uh, around the preparation of for teacher placement. Um, in that, you will have uh, a piece on one's own background, as I said, the biography, a habitus, as, as Bourdieu might call it, uh, their life experiences, how it is you came to do what you're doing. Um, there will be a sort of class profile of adult learners and all the diversity and the super diversity that's there. I didn't mention it on the sleeve, uh, Stephen Vertovich's idea that there is no one group. So if it's adult migrants, um, for example, there's great diversity even within um, that sort of category, if you like, or others with intellectual disability there again, there are very different personal strengths and needs therein. So really getting to that level of depth about who your learners are is really important as well. That's the kind of the inclusive benefit of knowing who it is we're working with. And therefore teaching and learning needs to be adaptive and flexible in, in, in that regard. So much of our teaching and learning methodology conversations will be based on science and evidence and research studies, but it will have to come an awful lot from their self-selecting out and, and, and with regard to their own learner cohort and the particular um, uh, responsive teaching that they will be doing as a result of that. So this portfolio is really important. It's got a very strong reflective element. It's got a very strong inclusion element. It's got teaching and learning uh, components to it. It's got industry standards relative to where you are coming from part to it. Um, it's got the reports and the acting on the reports from the supervisor's perspective. So the supervisor um, is also that point of contact at teaching placement um, so that the university doesn't become a place where an academic comes in and out, but that the tutor stays with that student throughout the year one and throughout year two. And then the idea of having the diverse authentic settings, depending whether uh, that's possible because you could actually still be in one setting and having to work there for the two years because it's your place of employment. But if it is too different, then you've got two different experiential pieces to your repertoire, if you like, your, your professional repertoire, which is really powerful. Um, and so, yeah, we, uh, you know, uh, we will in time hopefully have memorandum of understandings with colleges. We don't have that currently with uh, adult education providers. So there will be a kind of a working with the ethos of the place within which you're working. Um, and the responsibility to do so. So it's not all down to the university. However, the university holds the primary certification um, responsibility. Um, that's in our Education Act, actually, when it comes to post-primary schools. Um, and I think many institutions would be happy that the university takes that role anyway. Um, but um, being part of the culture and ethos of the places within our work and us being closer to that actually is really important. So as you say, Hannes, it's really important that the teacher educator is in touch with the groundwork and the work done out there. And many, many NGOs and others are part of our team, actually. Our, uh, people who work in NGOs uh, will be part of our team, our teaching team. So it's not the university doing all the teaching and learning. It's very much a shared enterprise. And that means building up partnerships. And that takes time, effort. Uh, but I suppose we can only start where we can start. And uh, that's the exciting part as well. So thank you, Hannes. I hope that's answered some of your questions around teaching placement. Thank you very much, uh, totally. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Hannes and, and Steve. Um, I have one comment and one question from the audience. Um, the Dr. O'Brien was right to underline that we as adult educators learn with adults. Um, and, and that's based upon underlining the very much Frarian focus. And then the, the question to Dr. O'Brien is, what are the main challenges to your program at UCC in the professionalization of adult educators? Yeah, thank you, Leslie, and thank you to that contributor. Um, I'm sure Seamus would be able to highlight some of the challenges at university level for setting in place a program. Um, at the very practical level, it's, um, it, it, it's, it can be challenging to, to move goalposts and to, um, I suppose, have people um, come on board and believe in the vision. Um, and it takes um, distributed leadership, Seamus being 
a front and centre to that for that to happen. So uh, that's the first thing. I think you need allies um, to, to work across and work with, and you need to put in place a good team that will be supportive of the idea. And um, so I think, you know, in our case, we had both university approval to go through with this programme, um, two big stages, actually, uh, what they call the outline planning programme and the full planning program uh, piece uh, and then we have professional accreditation so in Ireland we have as I said the Teaching Council Act of 2001 they are the the body overseeing the teaching profession it was very important for us to have level nine which is master's level um, because that is the case with post-primary and given our history lessons of the status divide between vocational and liberal that was deliberate um, so again, that's about us learning from our history, looking back to look forward. So that was a really important piece as well. So the challenges is really to try and, first of all, you know, um, have perseverance and a great team that will push this through. It will take some time. However, we're hoping that the, uh, the benefits will outweigh some of those challenges. They're just practical ones. I think the other ones is really finding out what's happening out there. And, and this network is, is, is fabulous for this because this is an area of uh, primary concern. Um, you know, the professionalization of adult educators is the primary concern for this. Um, so what do we need to put in place? So conceptually, we had to work that one through. Um, and then practically, a lot of practical considerations about what can be done, particularly at weekend level teaching. We're talking Friday afternoons and Saturdays um, um, and being flexible in our curriculum arrangements and so on. So there'll be many, many challenges and there, I'm sure there'll be many more. Uh, one of the things is, um, I suppose, just being open to the fact that whoever we get, we must have a degree of flexibility around that, that you cannot set in stone the curriculum uh, and the assessment piece uh, in advance of meeting the learners. This is the big, we know from adult education, um, we would like to do this, but of course, university systems ask for everything to be sort of preordained or preset. Um, so we've left enough, hopefully, wriggle room for us to satisfy both the accreditation piece and the right thing by way of andragogy. So there's always that tension between the fitting the system and 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 doing the right thing by way of our principles. All right. uh, thank you, Steve. We have one more question that we can provide you with from the audience. It is about the mentors. How are the mentors selected in placements? Um, teacher education is a relationship, the student, teacher, university supervisor, and placement mentor. How do mentors work with the university supervisors to ensure they have common knowledge in preparing student teachers? So mentor selectment, and then how do we make sure that those mentors uh, prepare the student teachers? And we have about three minutes left. Right, a, a really excellent question. It's such an important part of um, education, the relationship. And so we, um, I myself will be teaching on this program on Saturdays and my colleague, Finola McCarthy will also be there and we'll be looking at the professional preparation, uh, the Saturday sessions, if you like. And we will be also mentors um, so that what we're seeing out in the field, we're bringing back into the university and being aware around that. It was important that there was two of us for moderation purposes and for sharing purposes. And um, so of the team, two are part of the teaching team. The other two are highly experienced um, FET educators, one of which is retired recently, uh, but is very much involved in lifelong learning, Mr. Willie McAuliffe. And another um, is actually a practicing teacher in the sector, um, enabling and being enabled by the institution to be released. So I think there's a great empathy with the field. There has to be an empathy and a, an understanding of the places within which we are going to visit and then bringing that back into the classroom as well as this, the other student teachers bringing their own experiences to bear. So that theory practice divide, it shouldn't be a divide. It, it, we're, we're trying to sort of um, um, join them in some ways, um, having some sort of praxeological relationship between them. So that's 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 a really key thing. And I think who you are as a person is really important and understanding the challenges that student teachers will have 
uh, many will be practicing teachers, but you could be 20 years experience, but you could be 20 years of just the same experience as well. So some of the things is the mentor needs to be healthily challenging, not in an unduly fairly way, but in a constructive way. So again, we, we focus on the formative. What are you doing well? What areas could be developed mutually? And what are we going to do together about it? So that relationship is absolutely key. And on a personal affective level i think somebody if i go back to frere's text on all the all the qualities of a teacher i think humility is there and honesty and other other things um there are things that need to be shared amongst the mentor team itself on a regular basis um and after each visit we there's a big debrief and a meeting and that goes back into the whole group as well uh, to give a kind of a generic feedback so it's constantly keeping in touch i think and being a type of person with others and, and, and helping one another get through together. Um, and of course, it can be an hugely rewarding experience for us to learn from one another as well. So I hope that's answered Thank some of your yes. questions about mentorship. Thank yeah. you, Steve. Yeah. It's wonderful. Uh, all right. So once again, thank you for joining us on behalf of Research Network 3 and uh, the coordinators, Hannes Schroeder and Chen. Uh, we would like to especially thank uh, Dr. Seamus Otuma and his staff for providing us this opportunity uh, to provide this. And of course, thanking Dr. Stephen O'Brien for his presentation and his wealth of knowledge. Um, the In the chat, we've posted both the link to his program and the link to the ASIM Lifelong Learning um, Organization. I need to thank Dr. Hannes Schroeder for his comments too on the EU perspective and the wider um, ideas about adult professionalization of adult educators. So Nia, if you can bring up the slide, that'll give us the QR code that the attendants can uh, go ahead and scan and they will be able to take a survey and receive a certificate of attendance. And then you can see there if you would like to join the research network and learn more about our uh, professionalization of adult educators, the email is there, asmllhub at ucc.ie. And I wanna thank you and thank you all for joining us and have a good rest of your week. Mm -hmm.